to the third event in the webinar series from Tallinn to Tbilisi, Art Across Boundaries in the Age of Empire. I'm co-convener of the series together with Dr. Louise Hardiman, and we are delighted that so many of you are here with us today. We wish to thank the Visual and Material Culture Research Centre at Kingston School of Art for hosting and generously funding this series. Today, we are thrilled to have Dr. Bart Pusha with us, who will present his talk, Incising the Future in Early Colonial Alaska. Louise will introduce Dr. Pusha shortly, but first I'll set out some housekeeping points. Today's lecture is being recorded. Your cameras have been turned off, uh, but if you find that you do have that capability not turned off, please could you turn them off for the duration of the presentation and uh, mute your microphones if they haven't been muted already. Our intention is for the video to be shared publicly by the Kingston University website. Following the presentation, Louise will moderate a Q&A session. Please note that this part of the session will not be recorded. If you think of a question at any point, please use the Q&A function on your screen. If your version of Teams does not give you an option called Q&A, please use raise your hand. Now I'll hand over to Louise. Hi, everybody. Can I just apologize quickly to those of you who didn't figure that the time difference made uh, our start time 5 p.m. UK? Because I know I, I think a few of you um, came at four and I apologize if that was our fault in some of the comms. So let me introduce Bart, uh, Bart Pusher, our uh, speaker today. Uh, Bart, Dr. Bart Pusher teaches art history at the University of Copenhagen, where he works with the international research project, The Art of Nordic Colonialism, writing transcultural art histories. He received his PhD from the University of Maryland. His research focuses on issues of race, environment and materiality in order to center global narratives in the indigenous and the wider Finno-Ugric world. As a scholar and curator, Dr. Pushaw collaborates with museums and collections in and out of the Arctic to propel the accessibility of Inuit cultural heritage and advance repatriation campaigns. In addition to his first book manuscript, Indulgent Images, he is also the co-editor of two forthcoming volumes, Unfinished Histories, Art, Memory, and the visual politics of coloniality and the material legacies of Nordic empire. He's also a contributor to the forthcoming volumes, Picturing Russian Empire and the Routledge Companion to the Global Renaissance. So welcome, Bart. We're thrilled to have you speaking uh, today and uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you both to Louise and Lauren for this very uh, kind invitation. I'm very excited that um, the field is asking these questions. I think that many of us probably agree or maybe a little bit um, overdue. I think um, today what I will be talking about is a little bit new new material for me and I come at it from a perspective I normally don't come at at the material that I work on. Um, so I don't have the same kinds of uh, relationships that undergird um, my other research in the Arctic, namely in Karakinunat or in Greenland. Um, so I'll kind of speak a little bit um, about my relationship to this project because I think it's it's um, I think it's important to think about the sort of those those ethical questions. Um, so without further ado, I will just uh, go go ahead and get started and explain kind of this genesis of this project um, and what does it mean to think about uh, art histories in early colonial uh, Alaska. Um, so this idea uh, and the material that I'm working on right now um, came from an encounter I had at an exhibition which was at Kumu at the National Art Museum of Estonia in the capital of Tallinn. So um, a few years ago, uh, I think in 2017 it was, 
Kadi Poldi, the director of, of Kumu, alongside um, Linda Kalyandi, a professor of history and art history, and Eha Komisarov, who is a curator at Kumu, had gone to the Venice Biennale and seen a work by the Maori artist Lisa Rehana that had represented Aotearoa or New Zealand. Um, and Rehana's work was titled In Pursuit of Venus Infected, and it was a, a large sort of colossal scale video work that recreated a sort of neoclassical wallpaper aesthetic uh, to reimagine and create kind of speculative uh, futures and past histories um, in regarding to Maori colonial encounters in the 18th century. Um, so in bringing Rehana's work to Tallinn, um, they used it as an opportunity in late 2019, early 2020, before the pandemic became a pandemic, uh, as a way to juxtapose, on the one hand, um, 18th century Maori colonial history and what that might mean thinking from a, a localized Estonian context. So I think now many of us might be uh, or obviously very familiar with the urgency of, of thinking about coloniality in, in Eastern Europe. Um, but I think even in 2019, just four years ago, I still think, especially in an Estonian context, um, this was a, a these are pretty new, these are pretty new questions. Um, and really the the point of this exhibition was also sort of exploring and just mapping out really for the first time what uh, imperial visual culture was from an Estonian perspective. And in the 18th and 19th centuries, of course, this means being entangled with the Russian Empire. So uh, on the right, uh, this is just one of the vitrines that was there. Um, and you can see there are juxtaposed three different um, porcelain figures that were on display. Um, from various world's fairs and other in interior exhibitions that were in Russia proper, delineating the sort of ethnic and racial diversity of the Russian Empire at its time. So at the back left, you see a, a Muslim man from Central Asia. In the front, you see two uh, Estonian peasants. This figuration is based on a very famous, um, well, in an Estonian context, it is famous. Uh, a Baltic German painting of Estonian peasants. And then in the back and the, the back right corner, you see a man standing with this elaborate uh, woolen chilcot robe and a spruce root hat. Uh, he's very identifiably of um, the Pacific Northwest um, and ostensibly is probably Tlingit. Um, if you're remotely familiar with Pacific Northwest iconography, you might notice that uh, the way that his robe is depicted, the designs are um, really kind of a bastardization of, of how, what they actually are and how they represent both uh, clan identities and other kinds of kinship practices. Um, but I, I show you this vitrine here because just this juxtaposition of thinking about the geographical spans of the Russian Empire and the various ethnicities under its domain and where Estonians as a finno ugric people that also have their own history of serfdom, um, how they fit into these questions uh, is something that the exhibition was trying to raise and, and, and talk about. Um, so another facet of the exhibition that really piqued my interest <clears throat> was the fact that there's a lot of this scientific ethnographic imagery of um, of different cultures throughout the Russian Empire, going all the way to to Alaska in the east. And what I was especially surprised at at this exhibition that I did not know was that Estonia also houses a quite significant collection of uh, native Alaska material culture. Um, and of course, in thinking about um, the fact that Estonia was part of the, the Russian Empire, it was obvious that, of course, that uh, Baltic actors had inherited right, the sort of Russian colonial period um, of Alaska, and that is the direct reason for why uh, material culture by Alaskan artists are in Estonian collections. But in my almost 10 years of, of working in and out of Estonian museum collections, I had no idea uh, that these that these objects existed. And so um, when in the same year in 2020, when I was invited to be I'm a co curator of a show which is now opening in May on uh, in Estonia in Tallinn on art in the age of the Anthropocene. 
and thinking about the sort of deeper environmental <clears throat> environmental histories of Baltic art. I knew that one facet I wanted to explore was the complicity and direct role of Baltic and especially Baltic German actors in the expansion of the Russian Empire and to the colonization of occupation of indigenous homelands in Alaska. Um, when I started this journey and trying to, to understand the objects that were in Estonian collections, it was quite different from the material that is made available about Alaskan objects that are taken and confiscated and stolen during the Russian colonial period um, from the 1740s to 1867. Um, in Finland, they also have a very large collection in Helsinki due, of course, also to Finland's connection to the Russian Empire. This has already been published in 1990 and made relatively available. Uh, the Kunstkamera in St. Petersburg were, of course, I'm sure as many of you are aware, have very large ethnographic collections, uh, many of which from Alaska, uh, have also published a really large catalog, both in Russian and fully in English. Um, already in 2012. But in the Estonian case, um, these materials weren't mapped to the same degree. Um, there is sort of one study that an, an outside a non-Estonian curator had put together a few years ago. I don't know that much about this project, but it, it's sort of um, an exception to the rule, I would say, in Estonian historiography. Um, and of course, part of these part of the the issue too, with the sort of invisibility of native Alaska and indigenous material culture in Estonia is also um, because of the the law and political processes of um, independence once it was restored to Estonia in 1991. So meanwhile, in Alaska proper, uh, and on Kodiak uh, Island, where the Alutuk Museum is which is um, one of the nations I'll be talking about today. Um, they recently established a digital sort of da database and repository called Amutat, or things to pull. Um, and the point of this database is also to map out where Alutic objects and material culture and human remains and ancestral remains um, are and where they're located. Um, the ones in Finland and Russia are very easily mapped, but the ones in Estonia are still uh, relatively obscure. So a lot of what I've been doing in the past year and also preparing for this Anthropocene exhibition that's happening in Tallinn in, in a few weeks um, is also just trying to understand what are the objects that are here, first of all, um, and then second, how can we also make meaning and understand them as object created in these um, colonial contact zones? And then third, how can we also help bring these objects home where they belong? So uh, last summer, I was uh, also very surprised that many of uh, the Alaska Native objects are not simply in the Estonian History Museum, which is in the capital of Tallinn, but there's also quite a, a, a large number as well of significant objects from Native Alaska makers, also in Tartu, uh, the sort of university town of Estonia, where the Estonian National Museum is located. Uh, this is uh, a Yupik Elkjak, which is a hunting visor made of steamed bent wood. Um, and you can see it is also decorated with uh, stylized representations of animals. So these are carved out of walrus uh, ivory, out of walrus tusk. And you can see this representation of, of two walrus heads sort of on the, the brim of the hat and then two stylized uh, cormorant birds. Um, the, there are also a plumage of feathers at the back. Um, this is a, a, a hat that is connected also to social status uh, among uh, men as hunters. It is also something that is made specifically to enhance the efficacy of the hunt among Yupit hunters. Uh, and for that reason, it's not something that um, Yupik would naturally give away <laughs> or let alone sell to other people because it has tremendous importance in upholding um, reciprocal relationships between Yupit and the animals on which they depend. Um, so it became pretty clear to me from just from the beginning of looking at what the material that is in Estonian collections is, is that um, just by understanding the purpose and, and defining what these objects are, that they don't really belong sitting on on shelves uh, 
in um, in a small museum. Uh, there are other other objects that are maybe more commonly collected that often represent uh, Lutic or Nangan populations. Uh, I'll look. I'll show a map in a second. I'll explain where these cultures live in Alaska historically. Um, and these are just two uh, examples of models of indigenous technology that are collected that are also made both before and after colonization. So I, I just show you these um, as instances of objects that sort of exist in these collections. And you'll see the emphasis too is also on hunting technology. Um, and you see this figure also has this very vibrantly painted hat. So similar to the, the Yupik Elkak that we just looked at, there's also a very deep tradition of painted painting um, vibrantly decorated hats that also create an aesthetic um, that please the animals that are being hunted. But I'll, I'll return to this in a second. Um, what I will talk about more significantly is one of the objects that we've decided to feature in this Anthropocene exhibition. And this is a, a whale tooth, a sperm whale tooth that you see on the left. This is a picture of me uh, holding it <laughs> in the collection. Um, so I will I'll sort of explain a little bit the, the iconography, but um, I also just sort of wanted to zoom out a little bit and think about the promotional image that I had selected for this talk, which was very deliberate. So I, I had picked this um, woven uh, grass pouch uh, made by an Alutic maker. Uh, as you can see, it is uh, both uh, inscribed uh, in Russian. There is a double-headed uh, eagle emblem. And yet, of course, on both the left and right <clears throat> are um, local designs. Uh, that are uh, were typical um, bialutic women uh, in creating and sewing uh, these pouches. These are made out of um, lime grass, which is this very tall growing grass. It is abundant at sort of sandy coastal zones. Um, Alutic in particular use this grass to weave into almost anything you can think of um, from textile mats to shoes to baskets to cups. Um, very often they, they've also developed techniques to to weave grass so finely together that it often becomes um, tight enough that it also holds water. Um, so there's a great amount of um, expertise in the fashioning of these sorts of objects that have a very sort of deep ancestral connection and uh, sort of inherited meaning of, of place. So I chose this, this of course, because I think it's a really great example uh, to think about sort of the cultural context and merging of different visual cultures as that begins to happen in the early colonial period in the 18th century, that at once you have a continuation of tradition and yet obviously um, this imposed literally imperial, right? It says imperial in Russian on the top, right? Idea of hegemony that's happening. So, uh, oh, I'm gonna sort of back up a little bit and explain the sort of historical and social situations of how these kinds of objects happen. Um, but I also show it here because I think it is also a great way to think about the confluences between uh, what is the extent of Russian art history, uh, what is the extent of American or Native American art history and the reality of Alaska where these different uh, these different subfields coalesce and create this generative friction and create a different subfield that has often sort of been ignored both by Russian Eastern European art history and thinking about empire, but also the way in which Alaska also, also often disappears from sort of continental North American um, idea of art history. So uh, more recently, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, Pacific worlds as these spaces that unite really distinct and disparate cultures. I took this map from um, Smart History and their um, discussion of the Manila Galleons, because I think right now in art history, when we think of Pacific worlds, at least to me, this is a field that is overwhelmingly determined by people who study colonial Latin America and uh, who especially focus on, <clears throat> for instance, as you see here, the Manila Galleons 
and the relationship between, for instance, Chinese artisans using African ivory to make devotional Catholic objects for subjects in Mexico or Panama or Peru, um, and the ways in which there are different artisans, there's different visual vocabularies coming together um, in the circulation between Asia and the Americas. That's also connected as well, of course, to, uh, to uh, European and Spanish empire in particular. So what I like about this map is the way that it actually crops out uh, quite a bit of, of the world. Um, and more specifically, right, I think there's a way in which when we think of Pacific, Trans-Pacific encounters, um, and we think of this really between Asia and the Americas, it seems a little bit silly that somehow Alaska disappears from this conversation because when you really look at a globe, um, not only because of the obvious proximity of the Bering Strait and those deep transcontinental connections that have, have um, fundamentally shaped uh, culture there and, and understanding this area as a, a cultural, really vibrant crossroads. Um, but also the fact that Alaska nations are not only trading with themselves and trading with uh, other Siberian populations in the easternmost area of the Russian Empire, but they're also trading with Ainu, with Japanese, uh, and also have deep ancestral knowledge also about the Californians. So there's also a way in which um, I'm thinking a lot about the way in which um, understanding Alaska also as a center of different cultures coming together, rather than assuming that it is on the edge of the Russian Empire, or conversely, on the edge of a United States-based kind of our history, and that when we really zoom in and localize and speak from these places and with these places, um, we have a really different kind of picture of I think what these colonial art histories could also be in the future. So just to sort of just give one example um, of a sort of pre-colonial object. So this is a, a hunting hat made by uh, Unangan. Unangak is the indigenous word that um, the native nation that lives on the Aleutian Islands or the archipelago, um, what they call themselves. Um, and many prefer that you use the word Unangan or Unangak refer to them, so that's the language I will use here. Um, they have probably the most developed visual vocabulary for these sort of hunting hats. And I just bring this example here because it's actually very uncommon that hunting hats are painted with figural imagery. And what I really like about this is that, of course, you see this really abundance of these Pacific marine worlds that exist there, um, of these really large whales to small porpoises. You see uh, there are hunters and slender boats uh, or kayaks. Right? This is also uh, Inuit language loan words into English. Um, and you also notice on the kayaks also all of the hunters have that same triangular conical hunting hat. Um, so what I also really like about this detail in particular is you can see uh, in the sort of upper corner in this area uh, the ways in which otters are painted in this recumbent position, floating on their backs and holding uh, their arms up to their faces. So this is a pretty common uh, iconographical representation of sea otters, uh, which I'll talk about more in a second. Um, but what I really also appreciate here is that this is this is a hunting scene, right? Where hunters are calling whales or they're hunting otters. Um, and yet there's a way too in which we can understand, right? It doesn't really appear as if the animals are uh, sort of swimming away in fright. There's a way in which you can also see um, this relationship between hunters and the animals they pursue seem to also sort of flow a little bit in unison. So even when we look at, at the otters and you see that there are hunters sort of encircling these, you know, enlarged otters, um, there is a way in which you can sort of understand how it is actually the animal itself that permits that proximity that allows itself to be hunted, um, which is a really critical sort of aspect to understanding the ways in which um, balance was maintained uh, between different sort of interspecies kinship um, in the Arctic. 
but this is just a, a detail that I really like. I also just like that, of course, by enlarging the otter to being, I don't know, 10 times the size of a normal Pacific sea otter, um, you also really get a, a sort of sense of its uh, sort of core importance in in local culture and life. There are also um, sculptures uh, of otters as well, and if you're interested in these, uh, I will. I'm writing an article about this sculpture in particular, so I'm happy to talk about that that later. Um, so I also wanted to sort of explain a little bit about sort of the what is the history of of sort of the colonial period. Um, and why does why does Russia colonize and occupy Alaska to begin with? So this is an image you see uh, in Russian. Uh, this site is called New Arkhangelsk, but um, nowadays this is the town of, of Sitka in Alaska. Uh, this became um, the capital in the early 1800s. The capital had moved a couple of times, and this is for a couple of reasons. The first is that um, the Russian Empire expands into Alaska, sort of following and sort of decimating local populations, both animal and human, um, sort of island by island as as they go across the archipelago and eventually onto the mainland. So Sitka is sort of uh, a coastal city that is uh, on if we think of southwest southeast alaska it's in the sort of southeast uh, coastal area what i like about this painting is that of course at first you see this sort of abundance of european sailing ships and this really very large flag and if you look closely at the russian flag you can also see a small outline of this double eagle figure that we saw in the elliptic uh, lime pouch um but then when you also zoom in and look at the details, you can also see that there's very, there's very similar kind of representation of in indigenous hunters that are also uh, rowing their own boats in this area. And this is also very interesting that you see this repeated conical hat shape because traditionally, historically in this area, this is not uh, Unangan or Lutuk homeland. Uh, so, this is also a very interesting phenomenon that the local Tlingit population, uh, who uh, Russians failed to subdue many times, um, are also uh, in a sort of um, animus relationship with other indigenous nations that uh, Russia has occupied. So my point in saying this is that there's also um, a forced movement of some indigenous nations into other places um, that are not their homelands and this forced movement that's also changing the social and conceptual geographies of what what Alaska uh, is and how it's working. Now, the other exciting thing about thinking about Alaska in the 18th century is that um, the archives are not only necessarily indigenous or Russian, um, there are also actually Japanese archives that uh, attest to and give us some insights and a different kind of non-colonial viewpoint and a different kind of outsider viewpoint into Alaska. Uh, and this is a little bit by happenstance. Um, and the long story short is that there were Japanese sailors who were caught in a typhoon um, and eventually winds had carried them onto uh, an island uh, that was Unangan homeland on the Aleutian Islands. Uh, where they had met uh, this very warm reception uh, by the Unanguk that they met there uh, because they had encountered these starving Japanese soldiers. But because Japan still in the 18th century had a very strict um, policy towards outside culture um, and its culture of isolation, the Japanese who came there were forced to travel uh, through Siberia onto St. Petersburg and would not come back to Japan for 10 years. So when they did finally come back to Japan, they recorded these images. And what you see here uh, is a Japanese rendition of Unangan housing. Um, and this is called uh, an ulok, which is a semi-subterranean home. So you see what you see them are actually uh, two people climbing out the tops of their homes. Um, and on the inside, this is not a Japanese rendition. This is a European rendition. Um, their homes look like like this. 
Um, of course, obviously, with any European rendition of indigenous culture, you have to be incredibly uh, suspicious and not uh, not immediately accept the veracity that is presented to you, per se, because of course it's it's filled by um, the agendas and biases of of the recorder. But what I really love about this are, are two things: one, that it really shows the way in which indigenous architecture really nourishes. Um, community and this um, idea of safety and, and sort of um, welcoming gesture, right? Intimacy of, of family life. But this also gives insight. You see, there's quite a bit of uh, woven textiles really on, on almost every every aspect of this house. Um, and these are the same kind of textiles that you see being quite abundant also in Estonian collections. So these are um, the same kind of textiles that are woven from that that sea lime grass that I mentioned earlier. Um, and you see in Estonian, it's also marked as Aleutid, uh, because the Estonian word comes from the Russian word. So Aleut or Aleutian is um, a Russian name that is uh, sort of imposed onto Unangak and Aleutic people or Sukpiak who live there. Um, and is from a lot of cultures, not the word that they want to use. Um, I also showed this picture. Both of these images are from the National Museum in Tartu. Again, the collection that is the least, the least mapped out. Um, also because you see an ivory sculpture of a sea otter. So this is um, what is known as a, a samanak or a charm that hunters use um, in hunting to also increase <clears throat> the efficacy of their hunt. <clears throat> and you can you can see in particular, it also repeats that recumbent position of sea otters folding on their back. They spend the majority of their time in the water. Uh, and you also see these series of holes that are pierced through uh, the body of the otter and as well as a sort of vague articulation of <clears throat> this skeletal form. This is because uh, both Unangan and Alutic um, knowledge um, knows that uh, otters originally were were human, and for various reasons, uh, there's there's different accounts, but um, for various reasons, uh, humans were a, a small group of humans were condemned to uh, transform themselves into otters, and so and this is uh, sort of established knowledge because of the idea that otters. Um, the sort of arrangement of their intestines and body and skeletal system is very similar, is very anthropomorphic. Uh, and so it also attests to the veracity of, of that knowledge. And so because of that, this also means that hunting otters is also sort of, um, it demands incredible respect uh, because you're also hunting a kind of human kitten, which is why uh, there is such a developed um, respectful culture around hunting and harvesting. So uh, that respectful relationship really becomes challenged uh, during the expansion of the Russian Empire and the occupation of Avunangak and Supyak homelands. Um, up through the 17th century, as I'm sure many of you probably know, uh, the main impetus for the Russian Empire to expand eastward is uh, the Yasuk uh, fur tribute system, uh, wherein uh, different indigenous nations across the taiga uh, sort of get pulled into and ensnared into a, a Yasuk uh, tribute system where they become, um, through after colonization is established, um, become beholden to trading furs uh, that Russia can then trade, especially with China and other Central Asian rulers. Um, this is especially um, sable fur, uh, and fur is really the motivating factor um, of continued conquest and extraction uh, as the Russian Empire moves eastwards. So this is just this is an 18th century um, Russian map, um, sort of explaining this con conquest and, and different uh, populations that they meet along the way. In the bottom, I think I'm I'm especially interested. There is a, a representation of an Aino uh, person, people who are indigenous to Japan uh, at the bottom of this, this map. 
so uh, when they're trading to China, this also happens because as the Russian Empire expands eastward, China also installs um, a new dynasty, which is the Qing dynasty, which also has a fundamental ethnic shift in Chinese rule. And uh, what that means is that there are also new aesthetic norms that come with this ethnic shift um, and that there is now a Manchu elite in China that replaces the dominance of ethnic Han Chinese. And Manchu particularly have an aesthetic preference for fur. And that aesthetic preference for fur is also what fuels some of the Russian Empire expansion eastwards. So this is a, an 18th century portrait, uh, an ancestor portrait. And you can see uh, this figure is wearing this really elaborate brown coat. This is an outer coat known as the Duan Zhao. And this one in particular is made from otter. Um, and Pacific Sea otter especially became really valued because um, Pacific sea otters have some of the densest fur of the animal kingdom. Um, and so, and also because they spend the majority of their time in really frigid cold water. Um, it also, the fur is also very buoyant. And so for that reason, it's also incredibly uh, luxurious and was especially in demand increasingly in the 18th century. So almost at the exact same time that sort of Russian colonial forces um, and intermediaries on as Promyshleniki, um, reach the Pacific coast, there's also this very high Chinese demand for fur. And so this is the reason that Russia expands into the Pacific is to harvest otters. So there's also other Japanese uh, renditions of this encounter, um, but I don't read Japanese. So sadly, you can't learn all the languages to, to do all the archival uh, information, but I just wanted to show some images. Um, which I'm happy to go back to in the Q&A if there's interest. Um, but I wanted to sort of shift focus really quickly um, on this whale tooth I mentioned at the beginning that is at the Estonian History Museum. And so this is the same whale tooth that uh, will be featured at this Anthropocene exhibition at Kumu. So I was very interested in this whale tooth because I, in my very limited experience, had not come across um, this kind of incised carved pictorial language on <clears throat> on whale teeth from Sukhyuk. So there is a, a very developed, robust um, history of carving on walrus ivory, especially among Anupiat and Chukchi, a little bit further north in Alaska. But among Sukhyuk communities, I hadn't I had never seen examples like this. So I also was just very interested in sort of understanding what is happening on this tooth and what kind of visual information, what kind of evidence is it providing us? So when you look at this uh, tooth, you can also see that, you know, there are uh, five different boats. There are two figures in each boat. Most of them are doing a different task. Some of them have harpoons they hold above their heads. Others have a bow and arrow. Others in the back are uh, holding oars to propel themselves forward. Uh, when we turn the tooth a little bit to the side, we also see what they're chasing, right? There is this really this abundance of animals, right? We see there are either small whales or maybe porpoises on the bottom of the tooth. But what we really especially see, right, is again that repetition of this recumbent design of sea otters. And not just sea otters, right, in abundance of sea otters floating on their backs with their arms up to their face. So when we turn it, oh, and then here's also, of course, the sea otter sort of iconography. And of course, you know, they're very cute. You have to, you have to mention. Uh, when you turn it again, you see that there's a similar structure on the other side of hunters and harpoons, bows and arrows. But I think what's especially interesting is that the fourth time you turn it around, that animal abundance almost completely disappears, right? There's this entire part of the tooth where there's this utter absence. So whereas we saw this abundance of otters and all sorts of diversity of marine life, suddenly it's dwindled into almost nothing. And at least in terms of otter, there's only one, one otter. And so what I think is especially interesting about 
sort of that that cycle of hunters pursuing animals uh, and then that population suddenly disappearing is also that we know uh, that the promishleniki, the intermediaries that work to enslave Supkekanunangak hunters to procure otter pelts um, because they were reliant on indigenous knowledge to collect otters, um, had pushed otters actually to the brink of extinction. And this happened for a variety of reasons. Um, mostly because of the consistent demand and the forced labor by the Russian Empire um, to meet this, this Chinese market and this Chinese demand. Um, but also because otters themselves are very social animals. They float in packs in large families. And so <clears throat> when the reason for hunting is not um, simply subsistence, but is actually imperial extraction and capitalist extraction of, of acquiring as much as possible, um, that really puts otters who live in these social formations really in great danger and being ext extremely vulnerable. Um, there are other animals, um, the stellar sea cow, which is a, a Pacific cousin of the manatee that is actually driven towards it is it is declared extinct. So there is this way in which the sort of Russian colonial regimes of of extraction and of taking harvesting marine mammals has actually really devastating consequences. And so the practice would often go sort of from island to island across the archipelago and really decimate local populations. And, and once the populations were decimated, they would move to the next island. Um, and so what that also meant is that um, a lot of otters um, were really absent from these local ecosystems in some ways for almost like 150 years before they they rebounded. And so what I think is really interesting is that you really kind of see the way in which there is this dwindling of population. But on the other hand, there is also, I think, uh, a moment that because the tooth has this circular language, you can keep turning it. Right. Yes, you can read it as going from abundance into the consequences of overhunting. But when you turn it again, it also returns to that abundance, which I think is especially interesting when you think about, uh, for instance, the fact that most uh, indigenous cultures, especially here in Alaska, don't um, adhere to linear time. They don't think of time in a, in a linear start to finish way, um, but also in the ways in which that this isn't just a sort of warning about what has happened, but also I think can also be read, hopefully, I think right as a possibility that can be realized, which we do also know that otter populations did rebound by the 1970s, early 1980s. So this did actually happen. And so this is also kind of this, the reason that I was thinking about this idea of um, incising the future, right? And thinking about the ways in which this visual language is not only commenting on the incredible violence and coercive conditions that indigenous hunters are meant to operate under, but also create a different kind of possibility for the future. So the last thing I kind of just wanted to say about uh, <clears throat> this tooth is that when you look really closely at it, you can also notice there's really different kinds of, of hats that these hunters are wearing. So I keep returning to hats, but they're they're incredibly important in this Alaska context. So um, one of them you see I highlighted in, in this yellow box is that same conical visor that we've talked about before. Others of them have this rounded spruce root hats. These are important because they tell us that um, these are probably, this is probably a Sukpiak artist um, and not Unangan. So this means a, a Sukpiak artist, which is someone, a, a culture that is closer to Tlingit and uh, to Tlingit visual language. Um, which is something that didn't happen among Nongan in the archipelago far out in the ocean. Um, so that also helps gives us some cultural clues about the artists who might have made this. And then I think most excitingly, uh, the red um, that I've highlighted is a specific kind of colonial cap that only began in the Russian period. 
and is a sort of indigenous emulation of European and especially Russian fashion of the early 19th century that came there. So by including this hat, this also gives us this very clear marker in both time and space that we know exactly that this imagery of this tooth is coming specifically from the Russian colonial period and specifically uh, that the relationships about hunting, about abundance and dwindling, about exploitation and rebuilding for a new future is also specifically from this Russian colonial period. So I think um, what I am hoping to also do, right, is also um, use this information, uh, right, to not only right make, I think, um, Alaska art history is more accessible, but also make the existence of these objects um, more visible so they can not only be incorporated into these museum databases that are in Alaska, um, but also in doing so, we can also, I think, bring these objects out of these dusty shelves where no one looks at them and no one sees them, and no one takes care of them. Um, and we can also return these histories and these indigenous commentary on colonialism and indigenous, indigenous voices on colonialism. Um, back to their own communities. So I will uh, stop it there, but otherwise, uh, thank you very much uh, for listening.